great men be? No. <laughs> That's why I didn't feel you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good, too. students, God, so we can 
have more knowledge and understanding of the power and the anointing of God, Holy Spirit. Thank you for all of our covenant partners, our members, and thank you for the ones that are listening and the ones that are here in service tonight. And whatever we say and do, uh, that your name may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, in my group uh, email I sent out to all of my covenant partners and our members, one of the things I wanted you to do was have your Bibles. Have your Bibles, whether it's a Bible that you're turning pages, on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, uh, have your Bibles out because we're going to do some reading tonight from two different stories about the function of the Holy Spirit and how people reacted to that, okay? And so I need for you to have your Bibles out and let's talk about uh, these two narratives that the book of Acts is going to present to us so we can get a clear understanding of functions of the Holy Spirit then and the functions of God's Spirit with us today. Okay? So live in your ears. In our concluding lesson, first of all, we will see how the Holy Spirit provides inspiration, illumination, recollection, and revelation to the believers so they can preach the gospel and argue from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. See, it's going to provide inspiration about that. It's going to uh, provide undeniable evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Number two, the Holy Spirit would confirm these words through healings, miracles, prophetic insights. Okay? So when you read about the functions of the Holy Spirit, especially in the book of Acts, it's going to reveal those things. Healings, miracles, and prophetic insights. Third. The Spirit acts as the confirmation sign that a person believes in Christ. And lastly, the Holy Spirit serves as a living blueprint for how the kingdom of God was to expand, providing the time, place, and opportunities and people who would best respond to the gospel so the local church could be established. That's the whole general functionality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, to show that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, to confirm the power of the Spirit through healings, miracles, and prophetic insights, to give confirmation that a person believes in Christ, and to serve as a blueprint to how the kingdom of God will be founded, how it will be grounded uh, in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to show us, it's going to provide evidence of how the early church was established, okay? So, lift your ears, turn with me in your Bible, because in this conclusion, the first thing I want to show, I want to present to us tonight, is that you cannot play with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Can y'all say amen? amen? The Holy Spirit is too holy. The Holy Spirit is too powerful. This is a serious thing because people's lives are at stake. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us to magnify the name of Jesus. It's given to us as confirmation that Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. Amen? And in this early church, the Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost. So I want to present to you tonight that whenever the Holy Spirit has come upon us, or whenever we begin to walk in the presence of God's Holy Spirit, we got to be careful how we treat and what we say to one another. And I have to prove that in your scriptures tonight because uh, it is unrefutable evidence that there was something that happened in the first century church that was a detriment to the anointing of the Holy Spirit, okay? So y'all stay with me, right? We're going to talk about this, and then the, the last one we'll do tonight is the story of Cornelius, okay? So everyone turn with me, and we want to turn uh, to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's start with that. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. 
This particular chapter and verse talks about the fellowship of believers. It talks about fellowship. The fellowship of the believers. It talks about the fellowship of the believers. From the New International Version, those who have your Bibles, and I know that you do, uh, let's turn to verse 42. Listen closely. There are some key words and some key nuggets to the power of the Holy Spirit here. It says they. They means, it's a, a plural. It means the people. It means the believers together, they, not me, not I, but it says, the key word here, one of the key words is they. They what? They devoted. You know, how about that word devoted? They devoted. Right? Themselves to the apostles. That means the church folk was committed to the lessons and the teachings and the preachings of God's apostles, those who had walked with Christ, especially Peter and John. Teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to pray, right? The breaking of physical bread and to what? Prayer. Then what? Devoted, right? Who were devoted? Who were devoted? Believers. How were they devoted? They fellowshiped together. Okay? So, we tonight can say amen to that because that shows uh, the bringing together of God's people, Gentiles and Jews, because they devoted themselves to whatever the apostles was teaching. So that's the groundwork right there. That's, brother, that's how we start to build a house, brothers and sisters, okay? So let's move from Acts chapter 2, and let's turn to Acts chapter 4, a few chapters over, and let's look at verse 42, I mean, excuse me, verse 32 through 35. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. The believers shared the covenant of the Holy Spirit caused the believers to share their possessions. So in other words, brothers and sisters, what it's going to teach us in chapter 4, verses 32 through 35, after Pentecost and that rainbow word that uh, Peter had preached, the people fellowship uh, breaking bread together, sharing food, and they were devoted to prayer but it carried on. It didn't only stop there. It says here in verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, listen, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. In them. I get excited about that, brothers and sisters. Why was God's power so greatly inside of them? Because they recognized that what they had wasn't really theirs. And so they were willing to share, unlike some people do today, brothers and sisters. We can make an argument about that, that what we have is what we have, and you go get your own. Amen? But not in the first century church. It says, and i got to read that one more time because I love it, brothers and sisters. And God's grace was so powerfully. I like that word power. Not just in them, but it was working powerfully at working them all. That there were no, there were no needy persons among them. Oh, my God. Nobody was in need. Because everybody shared together. Why? Because of the fellowship, the breaking of bread together, prayer together. 
From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them uh, and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone who had need. So all of you ones that want to argue about New Testament giving, well, according to New Testament giving, the believers share their possessions. They sold their homes and they sold their land and the money they got from the sale, they brought it to the church. All oh, you ones that want to argue with me about 10%, amen. Hey, well, if you want to pay 10%, according to the word of God, sell everything you have, amen. Bring it to the apostles' feet or the man or woman of God's feet and it was distributed to everyone who was in need. What a wonderful world we would have, brothers and sisters. Amen. If this was to occur. So we can say that this is the foundation of the church. And I don't want to get to that great question, but what happened to the church? What happened to God working powerfully inside of us? That means more than just preaching. That means more than just teaching. That means more than just singing. It has to be about fellowship in the community of God. That's my whole thread all these nine weeks. Community of God. And how do we, how are we relatable to the community of God? By what the word of God says. It has to work powerfully inside of us. And it has to anoint us so much that when we recognize that somebody is hungry, when we recognize somebody it doesn't have any clothes, when we recognize somebody don't have financial uh, means to, to help pay bills or whatever, because they sold their land and houses, I don't know how much they got from it, but they brought it into the church because they looked around and saw that there were people who were less fortunate than they were. So we say amen to that. I love that. I love uh, chapter 2 of Acts verse 42. I love Acts chapter 4 verses 32 through 35. Amen. But we got to move on. We got to move because I know somebody's watching me or watching us. Some of y'all that's listening on the teleconference, y'all that are here today, I know you said amen. I know you did. I know you like when we talk about the powerful grace of God. I know when you when you hear about how God uh, worked mightily among them and in them. Amen. I know you love when it says his grace. I know you love when it says uh, that they shared everything. I know you love it. I know you love it, brothers and sisters, when it says they were devoted. They were devoted. They sat there on the, on the Sabbath and they listened to the apostles preach Jesus. And their hearts got filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You know how it is on Sunday morning. And the teaching, not only uh, uh, the preaching, but the teaching. It says teaching, the explicit. They were explaining, you know, Jesus the Messiah. They were explaining God's grace of giving us Jesus. He given his life. And people were coming to the church. All of us say amen to that because it says here, it calls them to share their possessions. But I got to tell you. I got to tell you, I got to tell you, there's always someone or somebody, deacon, deaconess, minister, all y'all watching me, there's always some people that will interrupt the flow of love given to us by the Holy Spirit. Ah, yeah, I know y'all said amen. Now y'all said it with some vigor. Y'all said that with some, some y'all been in church all your life, you know Oh my God. There's always people, y'all, y'all write this down. That when the flow of God is working powerfully inside of us, and we start doing what the Lord has instructed us to do, there's always a person or persons that think they can outsmart God. And they think God is not watching. And they think because God is not watching, God won't react. Mm -hmm. But can I tell y'all a story before I get to Cornelius, as we talk about in our conclusion? Listen, brothers and sisters, this word, community of God, or these words, these three words, 
community of God, I didn't put that up on the board nine weeks ago for nothing. Right? I didn't put theology, learning of God, for nothing. It was all a plan of Pastor Galvin to get us to this conclusion tonight. It's been a thread throughout my whole nine weeks. Amen? Amen. The community of God is most important to God. That's why it uses all the believers. That's why they use that word they. Listen. That's why they use that word themselves. Look at all the words. It never said me. It never said my. It never said I. It said uh, they devoted themselves. They said all believers, right? Uh, persons. So it was a collective effort of God being concerned about this new community that was being created called the church. Okay. This is the birth of the New Testament church. But let me get to my point. In Acts chapter 5, I see a problem. Everybody turn to Acts chapter 5. There's a problem there in verse number 1 through verse 16. There's a problem. What is it? Ananias. Ananias. And Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, brothers and sisters that's watching and listening, they were a married couple. They were a married couple. They were married, husband and wife, who lived in this atmosphere of believers, who lived in this atmosphere of they, uh, possessions and selling, land, houses, personal stuff for the needs of others. They were not, I beg to argue with you, devoid of the community. As a matter of fact, y'all can say amen to this, but they were actually ingrained or engaged or they lived in the community. Right? And listen, they saw all this wonderful power of the working of the Holy Spirit, where? In the community. They saw people giving. They saw people uh, blessing others. They saw that Spirit of God working powerfully in folk. Right? But something happened, and their heart wasn't right with God. As powerful and as magnetic as God's Spirit is, God doesn't force it on us. We have to make a decision to choose it. We've got to make a decision to choose God's Spirit through the preaching of the Word of Jesus Christ. So it says here, Now a man named Ananias, uh, two, I put two N's in there, it's supposed to be an A. See, I can't, I can't write these first century words. But anyway, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Let me stop right there by the power of the Holy Spirit. They did the same thing. The Bible said they did what other folk in the community did. Why? Because we can call it a community effort, right? So they sold land. Other folks sold land. It says, number two, with his wife's full knowledge, with his wife's Full knowledge. Right? So I didn't have enough for Patricia. <laughs> Patricia, I know she watches. She said she's gonna watch tonight. She's all working. Hey, Patricia. With Patricia's full knowledge, my wife's full knowledge, the Bible says he, who is he? Ananias, the husband, kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Wait a minute. I just read to you, y'all said amen. When I read it earlier, that they brought, they sold everything and they brought what? Everything. Let me put that up there. They brought everything to the church. 
They brought everything to the church and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Listen, the thing about Ananias and Sapphira, brothers and sisters, first of all, they didn't have to sell it. No one forced them to sell their land. No one, nowhere in there where they say any of those people were forced to do it. Right? It was just that the Holy Spirit was working powerfully in them through the preaching of the apostles, or by the preaching of the apostles. Right? But it does say they had to give anything. It does say they had to sell anything. They did it when they saw others do it, but yet still their heart was not right with God. Because it says, with his wife's approval, because she had full knowledge, he kept back part of the money. Right? He kept back what he said he wouldn't keep back. He kept, he broke the agreement with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He broke the agreement with God. Because God did not say you have to sell it. Matter of fact, you could have kept it. And you would have been all right. But you wanted to do what other folk, like people do today. You want to show up that you can do what others, but you want, like Judas, you want to be the keeper of the bag. And you want to hold back from God. Brothers and sisters, I tell you, we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about how powerful, yet still, there's some people trying to cheat the Spirit. And whenever you try to cheat the Spirit, you're on dangerous ground with God. Because there's nothing that we have that really belongs to us. I say this time and time again at Mount Calvary. I say this time and time again in Bible study. There's nothing that we have that belongs to God. And God never said you had to give all of it. There's no way God said you had to give all of it. They decided they would do that as a community. But there was some folk there. This is, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan, oh my God now, I don't want y'all to keep quiet on me because I know we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Y'all are, yeah, 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 yeah. But now, hey, Satan. You see, that's what happened with Satan, Reverend. Uh, when Satan sees good works, he's going to come into your heart if it's not filled with God. So it says, it's Satan, hey, Satan, as he's calling you. Satan, Peter asked Ananias. You know, they taught me in school a direct, direct question. Demands a direct answer. Uh, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have what? Lied. Y'all can talk to me. I know we're on camera tonight. I know. But it's all right. This is the last one. You have what? Lied. And lying is what liars do. It's in their heart. He said lie. Now, it would have been more understandable if he had said lie to me. Right. But he said, have lied to who? Holy Spirit. See, the community is so important to God that when you start telling lies, you have your whole community. See? And it says here, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. He could have kept all of the money, brother. He could have kept it. But he said that he was going to get it. He said, like all the people in the community said. But listen, so why would he hold, why would he hold back something? And why would he hold it back if he, if he said he was going to get it? Why did you sell it if you weren't going to do what other folk have done? And so it says here, didn't it belong did it belong to you before it was sold? That's the question. And after it was sold, was the money at your disposal? So those two qualifying questions. Did it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but you lied to God. In other words, what Peter was saying, it was yours. It belonged to you. The money was, that was sold was at your disposal. You came and promised the church that you were going to give it all. But when that money, the love of money is the root of all you. It's not money. It's the love of it. And when you saw that money like a rich young ruler, you saw that, that you probably thought you were going to sell the house for 10000 
they end up selling for fifteen thousand. You say, well, since I promised them ten thousand, I'm gonna keep them. Y'all got me now. Let me say that one more time. You saw that first of all, you promised you sell everything, right? They told you they were gonna buy uh, the house for ten thousand, right? That you owe that to God, but you sold it for fifteen thousand, and you kept the five thousand and gave the ten thousand, right? And, but you lied about it. You lied and said you only made ten thousand when you made fifteen thousand, and you could have kept the five thousand if you wouldn't have lied about it. Y'all stay listen. It makes sense. And he says, You have not lied to me, brother, sister, whomever. You lied to the one who gave it to you. And do you not know God sits high? And he looks low. He sees everything we do. Amen. And he hears everything we say. When I when listen, when Ananias heard this, I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's serious. It says there in verse 5 for those who are reading with, with me in your Bible, he fell down and what died. And it amazes me that he didn't get to say a word. He got snatched out from this world. And then it said, and when that happened, think about it, D. I mean, uh, D, think about this. We saw, uh, see somebody go up there and promise something. We know they lied. He said, Sister so and so, brother so and so sold that house for 20000 And I see on this piece of paper, they only wrote 5000 And they fell dead. He said, and great fear, not just fear, but terrorized. Sees all who heard what had happened. Then some young men, I guess they must have been deacons or trustees, came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and did what? That was the quickest funeral mm -hmm. in the history of the world. <laughs> right? He died in the church. They picked him up in the church. They covered his body in the church. They took him to the local cemetery and they buried him because he lied not to men and women. He lied to God. And let me stop right there. You know, telling me a lie is one thing. But telling you lies is one thing. But when you start lying on the Holy Spirit, that's why Jesus told the Pharisees, you got to be careful because you said that I healed this man by the power of Bezalel, right? And how dare you pervert the name of God by saying that Satan want to see people healed? Jesus said, you got to be careful. You're about to cross a line, the unpardonable sin. You're about to cross a line when you give the glory of God to another. And then it says, oh my God. Now that's one thing. When I begin to read the word of God, it says, about three hours later, where was she at? <laughs> where was she? Where was his wife at three hours later? <laughs> at the bank, counting up that extra money they had. <laughs> It says his wife came in. Well, first of all, it must have been a long church service because it was three hours later. But I tell you, when the Holy Spirit started wrong good works in our lives, we can't control, we can't control the Spirit. Uh, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. She didn't see them go past her, taking Ananias to the grave site. She didn't know what was happening, and didn't nobody in the service tell her. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Is $10,000 what you got for the land? Okay, now I said they made fifteen, dollars But he asked her a qualitative question. She said, that is the price. So his wife come in and lie. And you know why? Because if you go back, she had full knowledge of what he was going to do. And she didn't, if she didn't see him in service, she had to wonder where, where he was. He got there in the graveyard. It said, Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of God, or the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door, or at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and what? Died. So the last word she said on this earth was, yes. 
She said, that is the price. That's the last few words she said. That is, yes, that is the price. Not knowing those were going to be the last few words upon the earth. And it said, at that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. They had undertakers in the church. And then it says again, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And then it says, after that happened, the apostles performed many signs and wonders, as I foresaid, among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women, more and more men and women, believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and met so at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were what? Healed. So God says, Let's get rid of the interruption. Let's get rid of the distractions that's trying to interrupt the flow of love by the Holy Spirit for the community of God. Because you notice, brothers and sisters, if you will, let's go back for one second. You notice after uh, Sapphira, she died, then the Holy Spirit really started working one. And see, what the Bible teaches me in essence is sometimes there's always a blockade, right, from the anointing of God. And it's not that God can't do it because God is more concerned about the community. And even in the Old Testament, it was the community of Israel. In the New Testament, it is the church, right? And so God has always been concerned about the community at large, but you always have a gathering of folk in there, even in the church. You have little groups of folk that decide they know better than the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes God says, I'm trying to get my love and my grace and my anointing to the people that are believers, but I got this, this is blockade by choice. And God is not going to override our choice. He's not going to do it. He's, uh, the, uh, the man of God says, choose this day who you're going to serve. Amen. For as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. So, I like from verse 12 down to verse number uh, 16, because then they start performing signs and wonders. Uh, uh, more of them begin to join the church and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believed in the anointing of the Holy Spirit so much that they brought the sick. Uh, they brought the impure spirits, tormented by impure spirits, and all of them. And then what it said? No, it said all. Guess what all mean? Guess what all mean? All mean all. <laughs> all don't mean one half or one quarter or one third. And it says, all of them were healed. This is the moving, and notice, if you will, again, before we move on, they were out in the streets. Where is the, where's the streets? The street is in the community. It talks about the people. Where are the people at? The people are in the community. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, more men and women were added to their number. Men and women, where are men and women? They're in the community. See how all of this is going back to the community of God. And when, they, and when the apostles passed by, and the people were led on the mats and the beds, and it says the Holy Spirit was so power, powerful, it wasn't actually the human flesh of Peter, it was his shadow. And a shadow is not real. A shadow is cast by light. Right? So it was his shadow Right? The people said, if his shadow fall on us uh, as he passed by, then I know my loved one and my friend going to be healed. And it says here, lastly, crowds gather also from the towns around Jerusalem. In other words, remember what Jesus says? You can't just stop in Jerusalem. You got to go to Judea. You got to go to all the nations. 
right? You got to go to Samaria, and it says all the towns around Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is here. Here's Jerusalem. Or we could call it Mount Zion. And all the towns around, the towns. Towns. Towns around. They heard about what was going on there. Listen. And they brought, they rushed up there. Mommy, you've been sick a long time. Let's go. Daddy, you ain't walked in a couple of years. Let's go. Brother, you've been blind for a few years, three weeks. Let's go. You've been in a car accident or back then a camel accident or a donkey accident, horse accident. Let's go. You've been bitten by a viper. Let's go. And when they got there, the spirit was so powerful. And I believe it. How many of y'all believe it? I believe it. That the man of God's shadow was just walking by. And, and you know what? You know, they get me excited because it didn't say nothing about him touching them. It didn't say, it just, the figment of, the, of who he was, a shower. Walk past. And you put your loved one that was sick. And when the shower went past, it wasn't the shower that healed. It was the moving of God's Holy Spirit. So, so did Ananias and Sapphira get out of the way. Move of God. I like the move of God. The move of God. So that was one of my narratives that I chose as it relates to the power of the Holy Spirit, but also the distraction or the pretense to try to inter interrupt the flow of love by the Holy Spirit. Okay. With your Bibles open, in considering the story of Cornelius in the Bible. It is essential to know that being religious is not enough to save a person. Being religious, being religious is not enough to save a person, right? Because religion means only what you believe in. Because people believe in all kinds of stuff. So it's not really the religion, right? See, Cornelius was as devout as, devout as they came and worshiped the one true God. Yet he still needed to hear the gospel and respond to it positively. Listen, he still needed to hear the word of God. So he was devout. He was a proselyte -like to, uh, to the Jews. But he still needed to hear the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why God sent Peter, so that Cornelius could hear of the death and resurrection which Peter preached over in Acts 10, 39 through 40, and verse number 43. Only after Cornelius and his household received the message about Jesus did they receive the Holy Spirit and were born again. So you remember last week, I said that they did not receive the Holy Spirit until the men of God came down, Peter and John. That's what I'm saying. You can't just base all your belief just on that one narrative. Because here it is, it changed him. It says here, uh, after they received the message about Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit and were born again. So the devoutness of Cornelius was one thing and that was good but being just devout is not good enough until you complete the course. Right? The conclusion by believing in Jesus Christ and the message of, of the uh, cross and the message of the resurrection. The story of Cornelius not only shows the necessity of the gospel but indicates that God will move heaven and earth to bring the gospel to those ready to receive. God will do that for us. So let's look at Acts number 10. Let's look at Acts 10. Everybody give you a chance to find Acts 10. Acts number 10, brothers and sisters. Let's look at this devout Roman guard, soldier, centurion, however you want to call it. Cornelius and his household mean more than just his family. It was his servants and everybody else. 
which, which means what? They were a community. Here it is again. You can't get away from it. It didn't say I. It said Camellius and his household. That includes his children, his wife, and that right? His servants. Right. Look at chapter 10. Let's do some reading here because the Bible is the Word of God. So let's look at the Word of God. From the New International Version, I am reading. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God feared. Ah, that's good. They were devout and they feared God. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So here it is, a Roman centurion doing what God's covenant people should have been doing, right? Or uh, what they were doing, right? He was doing the same thing. Why, you may ask? Because he still, although he's a Roman centurion, he can't get uh, away from the word community, okay? One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him. What is it, Lord, he asked? Where have you heard that story? Yes, Saul of Tarsus. Right? The Lord appeared to him, called you by name. Has the Lord ever appeared to anybody in your spirit? And when the Lord calls you by name, he called Jacob by his, by his name, by his new name. He called Moses from the mountain. He called uh, Elijah from the mountain. Called, he called Jonah when he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Whenever God wants to get us, God calls us by name. And guess what? He knows my name. And then what they sing on Sunday morning, he knows my name. Listen, the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor had come up as a memorial offering before God. Woo! Your prayers and your gifts to who? The community. The poor have come up as a sweet smelling savior in the nostrils of God, as a memorial. In other words, this so that simply means that God is honoring. Isn't it a great thing to know that God honors our prayers? He honors when we give to folk that are less fortunate. He said, well, I don't have it to give, Pastor. That's what sacrifice is. Ask Jesus. Sacrifice and hurt sometimes. And I know we have to be peculiar and particular sometimes. But every now and then, God gets pleased, or He is pleased, because you give right, out of the abundance of your heart. Now send men, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Verse number seven. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to John. Look at verse number nine. We just read, that's all, that's all we're doing tonight. We just read the word of God. Verse number nine. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all, oh, excuse me, it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That's how. We, that's why we got to be careful how we treat folks. Right? God has cleaned them, but we still call them unclean or right? impure. So there it is again, let me read that again. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. Three is the divine number of unity, right? And immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. 
While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Peter's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Have y'all noticed that? Three times the sheep came down and there's three men looking for him, right? So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, and the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to actually come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men to the house to be his guests. Let's stop right there. So look at the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just didn't fall out of nowhere. It was working, or the Holy Spirit works through vessels like you and me. And every now and then, because we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, God commands of us, God desires of us, He desires for us to go out to bid men and women to come. Right? There are people that are just sitting there, unbeknown to us, I've been known to Peter. He didn't even know who Cornelius was. Right? I've been known to him. God spoke to him. God spoke to Cornelius. And through the working of the Holy Spirit, speaking to one and speaking to the other, both of them got together. And God's Holy Spirit is getting ready to do something incredible because they were obedient, unlike Ananias and Sapphira. They were obedient to what the Spirit was showing them. The sheep that came down with the four foot beasts and animals on it. Cornelius having this dream. Now, who could ever fathom that God was working in this type of way? Right? God's ways are still mysterious to all of us. Right? And I don't know why God does it. I don't know how God does it. But every now and then, sometimes we can't sleep at night. I said this to Mount Cameron not too long ago in the sermon. Sometimes we can't get sleep. Listen, we're physically tired. We don't work all day. We don't devil for your job all day. You know, took care of your family, your husbands and your wives and your children, grandchildren. You know, took care of them all day. And physically, you are tired and your mind says it's time to go to bed. But when God is working powerfully inside of you sometimes, God says, I'm going to remove the sleep from you for a while because there's something I want to tell you. You toss and turn. You say, listen, I had insomnia. You take some pills to try to go to sleep. Uh, you do whatever to try to go to sleep. Hit your head, hit the head with a hammer or whatever. Trying to go to sleep, and you cannot go to sleep. Why? Because God is trying to tell you something. There's someone God is sending you to. And there's someone that wants to come into the church, but they cannot make the connection because you haven't spoken to them. Huh. You haven't said anything to them. Convinced would have still been waiting unless Pete, Peter would have come. So he said, Men, that he had authority over to go to Peter's house. Peter must have been kind of a frightened because he had never met Cornelius, not from what I'm reading. And guess what? Cornelius was a centurion. And so Peter must have had a little frightness to him because centurions were hated by most of the people at this time. But we understand, listen, we understand that Luke clarifies to us that this wasn't an ordinary centurion. He was God fed, he was devoted. Uh, to Israel. He gave to the poor. As a matter of fact, he gave so much that his giving and his prayers was set up as a memorial unto God. But that wasn't good enough. God wanted to bring this man in, right? And the only way this man could be brought in is through the one who walked with Christ. The one who saw the miracles of Jesus, right? And although Peter didn't understand, but let's look at the rest of the story. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives, listen, and his close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Good God Almighty. A large gathering, I hate to keep being redundant, but a large gathering of people makes me think about what? Community. <laughs> the community. 
Listen, a large gathering of people. Listen, y'all invited me to come and preach. I didn't know y'all would have all these little folk up here. Listen, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew. Listen, against whose law? Our law. And he said about the law of God. For a Jew to associate with a visitor Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anything impure or unclean. I like that, y'all. I have to stop there. God showed me. This is not my own idea. This is not my own ideology. This comes straight from heaven. An angel. It comes straight from heaven that don't you dare Mount Calvary and churches and covenant parties. Never call somebody that you don't know. Never call somebody that you're not familiar with. You can never label them or stigmatize them as just somebody or whatever. Because God said, just like I cleaned you up, I can do the same thing for them. As a matter of fact, God says, because I can clean he or she up, I can use them. That's why people were afraid of Saul. All they can remember about Saul, that he was a persecutor of the church of God. But God cleaned him up. He sent out a knife down there to a street called Straight and removed the scales from his eyes. And God said, go on down there because he's a praying man now. You see, so he said, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon. So all those threes is in the story. Three is the number of divine unity. Suddenly a man in shiny clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has what? Heard your prayer and remember your gifts to the poor. Sent to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell to us. So in other words, stop what you're doing, family members. Stop what you're doing, servants. The man of God is in the house. So we're going to stop everything that you're doing. Because they, somebody say, is there a word from the Lord? Yes, there is. Brother, you see how God is orchestrating this? Listen, God will turn over rocks in heaven. To get this to happen for us. There is no stone that God would unturn to save somebody. There's no ghetto. There's no place. There's no inner city that God won't allow to go to. To save somebody. Peter did not know Cornelius. But until he was familiarized with him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter gets there. He imagined. He goes as a Jew into a Gentile's house, which he never, by his law, by the Jewish law, was not supposed to happen. But listen, when God orchestrated, you better listen to God. So he gets there and thinking maybe we're going to talk to maybe four or five people. There's a whole bunch of them in there. Couldn't need to stop them from doing what they were doing. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. I got to stop there. I'm going to continue. Look, even Peter must learn a lesson. He must learn this lesson because if God had not sent him to Cornelius' house, he would have stayed in his realm of familiarity among the Jews. But God says, you remember what Jesus told you. You got to take the gospel and bid them to come, right? You know the the message of God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witness of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by he was not he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses from God had already chosen, but us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
He commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Remember, I talked two weeks ago that he is the spirit bearer. All the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You know, I'm about to get saved tonight. Just reading that. How many of y'all just reading that tonight? That's a powerful word, minister. That's a powerful word. I'm reading it to you. I'm already getting goosebumps. Because that's, that is, in those few words, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the salvation initiative of God, what Peter was telling Cornelius. And then he says here, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, to whom Ananias and Sapphira lied to, <laughs> came on all who heard the message. Listen, people say, why y'all get happy in church? Well, y'all, let me tell you about this Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, uh, he's powerful, and sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes, brothers and sisters, you can't hold your peace. Out of all that we've been through, when God's Spirit comes upon us and anoints us, we can't hold our feet. We begin to sing a little louder. We, get, we begin to preach with some anointing. We begin to teach with authority. We begin to sing because we're happy, because we're free. We begin to go into the community to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, this is what Peter did. And it says, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. All those folk that were gathered in Cornelius' house, the Spirit fell on them. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out even on the Gentiles. See, that's the thing I like about this story before I come to my conclusion. God will always have a witness. Listen, the others who were on the circumcised, they could not be devoid of this moment. They could not be devoid of the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles. They had to be a living witness that God was bringing them all together again. Listen, and it says they were astonished because they thought the Holy Spirit was just about them. Like church folk do today, you think that worship is just about us. Did you think worship is just about us coming together in this holy little sanctuary? But God says tonight, no, 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 no. I must bear witness. You got to have witnesses that it's for those who are lost. They need to hear the message. And then it says here, it says, uh, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were studies that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. And then it says, but they heard them speaking in tongues, and listen, and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so in order that they may be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Now he was devout. He was God speaking. But he had to hear the message, brothers and sisters. He had to hear that message. And when you hear the message of Christ, uh, what prohibits us to be baptized? Y'all, they said that either night, but listen, baptized in his name. See, people today try to argue about should you baptize in the name of Jesus Christ or you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why are you arguing about a drop a day? You know, as long as you believe and are baptized, as a matter of fact, the people on the cross was never baptized, but he was ushered into glory. Let me get to this conclusion. What is this conclusion? This moment of the Holy Spirit was not a one-generation event. What does it mean for us today? Even today, we need to receive the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and our ministries to the greatest extent possible to serve God well in our world. Both then and now, back then in the days of Cornelius and Peter, and today in the 21st century, the Holy Spirit is recognized as the living presence of God, which is active on the earth to expand the kingdom and spread the gospel into the hearts of all people. It didn't say it was inactive. It said that the Holy Spirit of God is still activated. It's still active until God says it's over. Why is it active? Well, it's active to expand the kingdom. God is concerned about the kingdom. Listen, the kingdom is the community of God, right? It is the community of God. When communities and his household, all people gathered, they heard the message. The Holy Spirit came upon all of them, and they were all baptized in the name of Jesus. And then you know what? They loved him so much. They loved the preacher so much. They said, come on, just stay with us. 
Listen, stay here with us. Ask them to stay for a few days because never have we felt like this before. Never have we been convicted like this before. Never have we been consecrated like this before. Preacher man, would you stay with us? We got some chicken for you to eat. We got some green things for you to eat. We got that big old bed in the guest room. Please stay because you have saved our life. The word that has come from you has saved our life. We thank God for you. Listen, Peter, I know you had to travel a distance to get here. I know you were confused when you got here. And all those that came with you, that were other circumcised, the other Jewish uh, uh, men or, and or women, I know, I understand, but you're here in my house. My name is Cornelius. This is my house. So me council is your council. <laughs> Listen, stay with us for, for a little while. Listen, and that's what God says to us today. Is the living presence of God. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is the living presence of a holy God. You can feel him every now and then. You can't lie to me. Your eyes don't lie. Your ears don't lie. Your nose don't lie. And certainly your lives don't lie. I know where I've been. I know where I is. And I know where I want to go. Right? And listen, by the power of God, he's a living presence. Right? He helps me to understand when I'm wrong. He corrects me when I'm wrong. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because I've been wrong many a time. But because it filled him so powerfully, and if Peter walked with Jesus, and if Peter was confused about what he was supposed to do, what about us? So the best thing for us to do is get with Peter and listen to what God said. The roads may get rough. The hills may get hard to climb. It didn't matter to Peter because the, the expansion of the kingdom of God must spread to this community. Little boys and little girls out there. People out there hurting. No, they ain't gonna listen to you at first. Listen, they don't know nothing about God. I'm not even talking about just the community. I'm talking about just people in general, right? Some people don't know about God. They don't know about the same. All they know is about their own self-preservation. And they don't know that that's a God who's ready to preserve them, not only for here, but for that kingdom that is to come. So I, I said this in my goodbye to you tonight, or not goodbye, but see you in a month. <laughs> Let me say this to you. Turn with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to leave you with this, brothers and sisters. And I got to leave you with this because God needs us. He needs all of us. It don't matter how educated or uneducated you are. They don't matter to God. God can use all of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. I got Bible. People in here that are turning their Bible and looking at their phones and their iPads. Listen to what it says in the New International Version. What we have received is not the spirit of the world. When you're born again, you have not received the spirit of this old world. As a matter of fact, let me stop right there for one and let me do some exegete again real quick. The spirit of this world slew me, lied to me told me I was this and told me I was that. The spirit of this world made me think I thought I was something and I was nothing. It led me astray, like a sheep going astray. That's the spirit of this world. Couldn't think right, couldn't act right, because I believe in the spirit of, of, this, of this world. But here, 1 Corinthians says, we have not uh, received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God change my thoughts, change the way we walk, change the way we talk, so that we may understand what God has really given to us. Now that we understand it, now I've done this for nine weeks, now we understand it now in our lives, what God has done, is doing, and promised he would do. We understand what God has really given to us, freely. Listen, it's not about the man or woman that's trying to sell you these things on TV, where you have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for salvation. God has freely given it to us. All you got to do, like the millions, you got to believe in the message. And God saves you. You got to be convicted by the message. And God forgives you. God delivers you, brothers and sisters that are watching. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. You got to sit down sometimes by yourself. You got to read the Word of God in order to hear what God's Spirit is teaching us. God's Spirit is teaching us. How can they heal without a preacher? How can they preach except they are sick? 
How can they call on him in whom they have not believed? You can't call on God if you don't believe in God. You must be taught the things of God. Right? And when you are taught the things of God, you can say, I confess the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. Expanding spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Listen, not book tickets, but spiritual taught words. Enlightenment from the word of God. See, we're not devolved from the community, brothers and sisters. We are a part of this community. That's why I gave you the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? I gave because that same Holy Spirit, which was radiant in the community, spreading all over the place. People were walking in the spirit, right? All of a sudden, then Satan tried to stop it. And just like Satan did then, Satan don't want the community to hear about God. Satan wants the community to be destitute, to always be poor, to always be the, the, uh, divisive and divided. That's what Satan wants. And the more Satan can divide us, especially in the church, that's why we in God's church, we should be talking about folk. We should be rolling our eyes at folk in church. We're all we have. God has blessed us. And when people that are, uh, are, are coming in and people see us, they don't want to see people fussing and fighting one another. Really about nothing. Why are people fussing and fighting in church? Well, you know, people fussing and fighting, they're like kids because they didn't get their way. How I many you got children? When children don't get their way, they start fussing and fighting. But the difference with children and adults, children know how to forgive one another and play again. Amen. No, it's <laughs> I ain't gonna like you forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not community. That's not giving up our possessions to help somebody. Matter of fact, you're actually lying to the Holy Spirit because you say you're born again. You say you love the Lord. You say you say you feel His grace and His mercy. But yet still, when God needs you, you lie to the Lord and give an excuse of why you can't do it. You didn't lie to me. You lied to the one that gave you the gift to do it. That's my lesson. Nine weeks. <laughs> Nine weeks. I pray God to God for all of you. I love all of you. I thank God for all of you. I thank God for your sacrifices on Wednesday nights. It's a sacrifice to come out. It's a sacrifice to turn on that on that uh, on your uh, Facebook. That's a sacrifice because I know you have families. I know you got other things you have to do. But listen, the word of God is so powerful. How can you not listen to? I've been changed. You've been changed. By his grace and by his word. So we thank God for you. Now, take a break. Study your word. Taking a break don't mean just rest and don't read your Bible. Find a good scripture. Stay in that scripture. Let the Lord speak to you through his word. I tell you, God has something to say if you only listen to it. Pray for one another. Pray for the community. My whole thread has been the theology for the community of God. So pray for the community. Give if you're able to give. Give. Help somebody. Let what you do, not only in church, but let what you do outside of church, be given as a memorial unto God. And you know what? Just like her neighbors, there's somebody that's waiting on you. There's somebody that's waiting on your voice. God's going to use your voice. Again, we thank everybody for supporting our, our concert on last Saturday. What a wonderful time we had. Here at Mount Calvary. I mean, we, we fill the place up. Got, well, you got to find chairs and put in aisles where people can sit. But we, we, uh, we wanted to do that uh, just to remember our fallen brother, Kevin Davis. We had a wonderful time. We thank uh, Minister uh, Faison for preaching on Sunday. Thank you so much. And uh, Reverend Roy for teaching Sunday school on Sunday. We just pray for all of Mount Calvary, all of you, all of the churches all over the land and country. Our covenant partners, we love them. We thank God for and just, we just give it all over, all over to the Lord. So please join us coming this coming Sunday morning where yours truly, that be me, <laughs> will be teaching Sunday school this Sunday morning at 9.30. Uh, I guess I've got a lesson I want to teach to you. Share it with your friend. Do like Peter. Do like Cornelius. Share our ministry with someone else. And God will bless you. And then after we teach on, on a Sunday at 11 o'clock, we'll be fellowshipping with our association, the Bear Creek Missionary Baptist Association, where yours truly will be bringing a word from God. Whatever God gives me to preach, I'm going to preach it with an anointing and power and through prayer 
by the Holy Spirit. So come and join us at Mount Calvary at 9.30. And then if you don't see us at 10.30, give us 30 minutes at 11 o'clock. Uh, Brother Turner is going to have us on at Bear Creek. Again, we pray for all those who are sick and shut in. We pray for all those who are in prison, all those who are destitute in war-torn countries and people that are just uh, broken and wounded. We lift your names up in prayer. So again, enjoy your sabbatical in August. Pray for one another. Keep the Lord on your mind. Listen to some good music, right? Dance through the house. If it's raining, sing and dance in the rain. <laughs> God, thank you for it. Let us bow here to pray. Father, we thank you for tonight and opening our minds and our hearts to your word. Dear God, we just love you. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, we have taught this lesson for nine weeks. We have tried to do the best we can to help others understand who the spirit barrier is. And that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for him being the single person and the only person that died at Calvary, yet was resurrected on the third day morning with all power in his hand. And we too, in our belief, now we can rise and walk in the newness of life. And Father God, we thank you for that newness of life. And now God, with that same spirit you have given us powerfully, we want to share it with somebody else. We want to share our possessions, Lord, because really, possessions all belong to you and you have desired for us to be good stewards of what you have blessed us with. Lord, let Mount Calvary and our church family be blessings to others, God. Our covenant partners in their churches and their church affiliations, let them be blessings to our community. Father God, we pray for our country. God, we pray for the ones who have lost loved ones in, in this horrific heat, uh, senseless killings and murders, God. Father God, we pray for our government. Lord, it seems like uh, they're not making the right decisions for the country because we're so polarized. But Father God, we ask that you would get in the mix yes. through the anointing of the Holy Spirit for us to continue to reach out to the poor, the ones who are destitute, the ones who are hurting, the ones who are lost. Father, we understand that we still have people overseas who are fighting in wars. And God, it seems like innocent lives are lost every day. So we pray in the name of Jesus for those people over there who are fighting, who are hurting in this senseless war. Father, we pray for Mount Calvary and all of our members, the ones who are sick and shut in. I can't call them all by name. But God, I lift them up in prayer that you will work a wonderful miracle and an awesome miracle in their lives and anointing in their lives. God, the ones who chime in with us, we call them covenant partners. And whatever we say for these last nine weeks, whatever we have obtained knowledge of, increase it, God, a hundredfold. So whatever we do from this point can be set up as a memorial that's pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church of God said amen. 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 Have a wonderful Wednesday. Stay safe. Get you something good to eat. Relax a little bit. You've been out in that heat all day. We look forward to seeing you uh, this coming Sunday morning. Until then, pray for one another. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you real soon. Bye.